Good evening and welcome to the 11th edition of Tata Literature Live, co-sponsored by Tata Projects and Tata Steel. This session is sponsored by Prime Securities. Coming up now is a panel discussion titled Emergency Room. Just a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of the session, so type out your questions in the comment section as the session goes along. Emergency Room. The name is such because our economy needs to be taken to one, I suppose, and that's something we've all come to realize. Why did it have to come to such a standpoint that there are no jobs in this country teeming with lacks of unemployed youths? Why was our country not prepared to handle the migrant crisis? No doubt the lockdown has severely impacted whatever was left of the economy. So now what? To speak on the topic today, we have Jayati Ghosh, the erstwhile professor of economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, who is now at the University of Massachusetts. She has received several national and international prizes, including the International Labour Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for 2010. She has advised governments in India and other countries and is also the Executive Secretary of International Development Economics Associates, an international network of heterodox development economists. Joining her is erstwhile RBI Governor and the Catherine Duzak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School, Dr. Raghuram Rajan. In 2016, he was named by Time magazine in his list of the 100 most influential people in the world. In his book, Fault Lines, How Hidden Fractures Still Threaten the World Economy, he has said, and I quote, and more than the quality of its institutions, what distinguishes a developed country from a developing one is the degree of consensus in its politics, and thus its ability to take actions to secure a better future despite short-term pain. Chairing this session is Govindraj Etiraj, television and print journalist and founder of India Spend and Boom, the latter being a fact-checking initiative. He anchors seasonal shows on Indian news television as well, the current one being Agons of Business on Bloomberg Quint, and the most recent being Policy Watch on Rajya Sapha TV. Ladies and gentlemen, over to the panel. Thank you so much, uh, Ratnabali. Uh, you know, we are in double digits already uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, GDP percentage. It's just that it's only, other, only on the other side. So the good news, however, uh, is that growth numbers are being revised. Uh, Goldman Sachs has just revised its growth forecast for India upward from minus 14.8% to 10.3%. Uh, 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 Moody's has also trimmed its contraction estimates to 8.9% for calendar 2020 from 96 earlier. Uh, the Reserve Bank itself has uh, uh, said about 9.5% uh, negative. So that to the topic of today, uh, we have to get back to positive territory before we you know, address the emergency room uh, uh, question that we are being posed uh, uh, in, in, this, in this discussion. We we'll likely hold there for a while and before uh, maybe aiming for maybe the stars uh, or so to speak or the real double digit growth that we all uh, aspire to. So the question is, is it feasible? Uh, is it destined? Because some of us uh, believe that we are destined for greater things and uh, higher rates of growth. And do we have those preconditions uh, or is it a moving target? Uh, and what would it take? And can the last eight months uh, particularly teach us something, uh, tell us something about resilience and growth? Uh, I get the feeling sometimes as a financial journalist that uh, uh, we seem to be uh, better at resilience uh, than at growth, uh, if, if going by how uh, corporate performance has been or the bounce back has been. But more importantly, uh, what could go right and what could go wrong as we uh, aim for uh, what we want to aim for uh, as, a, as an economy that uh, has its rightful place in uh, the global stage. So let's talk about all that. So uh, we are also in an, at an interesting time. We've uh, just had the elections in the U.S. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the, there is still some battle going on about uh, who will uh, be inaugurated on the 21st of January, but it does appear that it's uh, Joe Biden, and that has its own implications, uh, not just for the United States, but for also the rest of the world. So uh, let's start from there uh, and, uh, and then talk about uh, what we need to do as a country uh, in order to address the more foundational and fundamental challenges that we face, which ob obviously go back to the pre-COVID times uh, and then come back to COVID. So on that note, uh, let me hand over to Dr. Rajan first uh, and then uh, Dr. Ghosh. So Dr. Rajan, uh, welcome and it's over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, Let's start with the U.S. election, as you suggested. Uh, Joe Biden has been elected. Uh, most sensible people think it's pretty clear that he's won. And uh, he will be inaugurated on January 20th. I have very little doubt about that. 
The question is, what will his policies be going forward, especially if he inherits a uh, Senate which is still Republican, which looks like uh, it will be the case. And um, uh, for sure, the uh, many of the taxation policies that were on the table earlier are probably going to go out, and with that will come uh, limits on how much they can spend. The the president in the United States has a lot of authority, uh, as Mr. Trump showed, and can bypass Congress in many ways, but uh, especially on large spending uh, uh, and large taxation, uh, you still do need to have the support of both houses, which will be difficult in this case. But uh, he can do a few uh, a few things. The problem in the United States, as is the problem elsewhere, is that uh, there is a large number of people uh, who cannot adapt to the changes in the economy, to new technologies, uh, to the move away from um, hardcore manufacturing to a more service-based economy. And to help them, you need a substantial ramp up in access to various forms of skill building and education, which require a, a revamp of the economy. And uh, that they, the Democrats had plans. You could uh, quibble about the details, but they had plans. And now that is going to be more difficult. Now we have to see what emerges because clearly the divide is growing, the anxiety is growing, which results in the political fracture. Coming to India, um, I think the uh, most important thing to remember is we entered this crisis with uh, very modest fiscal room, partly as a result of uh, significant fiscal mismanagement over the last decade. I won't say just the last five years. We have been going down the path of uh, spending uh, without uh, worrying too much about the uh, longer run consequences, which is why we entered this with what uh, most people would say is a public sector borrowing requirement, an effective fiscal deficit, if you will, of about 10% of GDP. So if you're already spending 10% uh, more, uh, well, a huge amount more than you take in, uh, clearly you see yourself as having very limited room to spend more. And unfortunately, the pandemic required a lot more spending in terms of uh, helping poor households survive helping small and medium enterprises look through the pandemic and come out on the other side. Um, I think initially there was a lot of doubt about when it would end because, you know, uh, the average time to find a vaccine, people said the fastest time was four years. How are we going to do it? Now there's light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe by the uh, latter half of next year, uh, it will be possible to roll out a vaccine quite widely. So the entire economy has the capacity to recover by then. Right now, we have a two-paced recovery. The manufacturing sector is largely back. It's true of other countries also. There is pent-up demand, so it looks like, you know, uh, happy days are here again for that part of the, uh, of, and it is easy to get taken in by that and think there is no damage. Now, in reality, even after spending 15 to 20 percentage points of GDP on, on support, industrial countries think there will be a lot of damage, a lot of heavily indebted firms, a lot of firms will close down, there will be prolonged joblessness. We haven't done any of that. We have done modest fiscal support, and unless our firms are much more resilient, and it may be, maybe we can uh, operate through Jugard, but it is likely we'll have many more indebted firms and that will be, uh, we, we'll have a lot of firms that have never open up against the small uh, little enterprises that close down. And as a result, the economy will shrink for that reason. The growth potential of the economy will be lower going forward. So, I mean, if you're talking numbers, uh, you said we have shrunk 10% relative to the size of the economy before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, the economy was much lower than it would have been if we had grown at 7%, which we had grown for 25 years. So we had already slowed down considerably. We've further gone down by 10%. So if you're a student of, uh, of uh, you know, fifth grade or sixth grade, you can draw a straight line growing up at 7%. Look at something which was slowing before, gone 10% further, 
and you see how shrunken we are relative to our what could have been business as usual. We were unhappy with business as usual because we were not creating enough jobs. Think about how unhappy we should be with business as it is today. Take some numbers. Uh, employment, people are saying, is back. But if you look, a lot of people have left the labor force. Nine million fewer employed relative to pre-COVID pre times is what uh, recent estimates suggest. And it's matched by eight million more people demanding M Manrega sort of support. You look at uh, consumption of our households. Uh, one report I recently read says milk, eggs, meat, and fish, which is sort of more than food grains, but which more people have become accustomed to consume, down 20%. So we are not back. I mean, the uh, stock market suggests we are back. The headline numbers you see recently cited suggest we are back. Car sales, which really reflect uh, tr transshipment to dealers, says we are back. But it's a long road ahead. And the law, sooner we realize it's a long road ahead, a lot more needs to be done, and government has to be far more active than it has been so far. Uh, until we realize that, I think we will uh, be uh, much slower than we can afford. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, do you want to uh, go next? And uh, I mean, let's, let's address the larger question. I mean, the theme is emergency room, how to rescue India's economy. So you can pick up wherever you want. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I completely agree with Dr. Rajan's comments. I think there's a lot of uh, evidence that we we began the pandemic already with in a state of really economic mismanagement, broadly speaking. And there are many factors behind this. There was the demonetization, the completely crazy move that de destroyed the informal economy. There was a very botched goods and services tax implementation, which further destroyed the informal economy. Um, yes, Dr. Rajan mentioned, you know, the, the, the large fiscal deficit or rather the public sector borrowing requirement. We have to remember that just a few months before we had a massive tax cut, which by the government's own admission gave away, I think, what, 1.6 uh, lakh crore of GDP for, I mean, uh, uh, in, in revenues, which you could have actually spent in a much more useful way by putting money in the hands of those who would actually be spending it rather than corporations who salted it away to improve their balance sheets. And so we have entered a pandemic in which, yes, the fiscal gap was already large, but in a situation like this, if you don't spend, you're actually making matters worse. And so I think the word, what's very clear is that this was an attack, certainly on both demand and supply, but the attack on demand is coming on a series of attacks on consumer demand and on mass demand in particular. And you are doing nothing to alleviate that. And so, yes, improvements in supply will come as the lockdowns ease and so on, which they will never actually get completely solved until you solve the pandemic. But that's, that's a separate issue. If you don't help demand to recover, then private investment is not going to come up because, you know, they won't find markets. What, despite the automobiles and so on for now, I think the pent up demand, yes, a little bit, but it will taper off quite soon. So the government has to spend to put money in the hands of those who would actually spend it and have large multiplier effects. If they don't, and if they do exactly what has happened over the last nine months, which is that they're spending less because they're getting less revenues and so they're worried and so they end up spending less, that's the worst possible scenario. That's completely counterproductive because that actually means lower than anticipated economic activity, lower revenues and therefore larger deficit anyway. And of course, your deficit to GDP ratio will rise even more because your GDP will not have risen. So they are being uh, counterproductive in the worst possible way. If ever there was a, an absolute no, no time for austerity, it's now. And I think across the world, governments have recognized this. For some reason, the Indian government, I'm unable to understand it because there's not a balance of payments deficit right now. We don't have a big sovereign debt problem. It's entirely uh, some kind of weird colonization of the mind, which is preventing the government from spending as it must to enable any kind of minimally sustainable revival, I would argue. So what is to be done? I, would, I mean, it's, to me, it's very clear. You have to spend now. You, you don't have to say, well, you know, will I get this much tax revenue and therefore I will spend that much? No, you spend right now and generate the economic activity that will create over time more revenues. 
the fear of inflation, a lot of the inflation uh, in, I mean, there are, there are certainly issues in the supply chain for food commodities. There are certainly issues in the supply chain for a bunch of manufacturers as well. Uh, I would argue that spending has to be directed, first of all, through, let's say, expanding the employment guarantee to every adult in rural areas, getting rid of the 100-day limit, beginning an urban employment guarantee, massively expanding cash transfers like universal pensions and so on, which really we, I mean, our level of universal pension is obscene, 200 rupees a month still. And basically ensuring more demand while also moving to ensure those things that will assist supply chains to become functional and work better. And that's not <laughs> that is not crazily ambitious thinking. This is what many governments in the world are already doing. And actually, I, I cannot understand why this government in India is so reluctant to do what seems so obvious. Okay. Uh, are you pausing that or? Yes, I'm pausing. Yeah, yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, Dr. Rajan, let me, uh, you know, put the question a little differently as someone who's been uh, in, in a, on, on the table or around the table uh, at one time. Why is the government not doing the spending? You know, let me give you another illustration. I was eco interviewing uh, the economist Mahesh Vyas of uh, CMI. This was, uh, I think, in May or June, June, uh, where you know the informal uh, sector employment had uh, uh, unemployment numbers had really gone through the roof, and I think we had about 110 million uh, people unemployed at that time. And his point was that you need to put about 20,000 rupees per family. Uh, and that will go a long way in bringing back, uh, you know, or, or stabilizing the situation. So why does that, why does this government or, or any government in the past hesitate to do this? I mean, I think, and, and do answer this as you, if you were uh, uh, on the table or at the table at this point. Yeah, look, um, I can't get into the minds of the government officials. Uh, I do uh, think there are um, a few constraints but the question is, why aren't we working harder to overcome them? Uh, one constraint, of course, is uh, how do you get the money to people? Uh, we have uh, direct benefit transfers of various kinds, which could be upped for sure. But there will be people who are left out of that, that process. And so uh, if one was serious about it, one would spend a lot of time over the last few months trying to figure out how to get that last 10, 15 percent who are excluded from all these measures and find ways to get get so uh, the excuse there are no channels uh, sort of wears thin if you've uh, if you've spent six seven eight months doing very little in broadening those channels um, the uh, a second uh, is actually a a, a, a mistake in uh, in analysis saying that uh, dem this is about demand stimulus. And therefore, demand stimulus is, is pointless when the economy is half shut down. Let's do it later. Let's reserve the stimulus for later. That's a misunderstanding. The whole point of the spending right now is to keep the body of the economy together, right? You're, you're, you're feeding a patient when the patient is sick so that the patient doesn't atrophy further and is unable to walk off, uh, you know, walk from the bed when the fever dies down, right? So what is important is to feed the patient, to make sure the, pay, the economic body doesn't atrophy, which means our poorest families make sure that they maintain their, their health, their, uh, their living. That's, that's more, uh, as much a question, moral question as a question of also economics. How do you keep them from pulling their kids from school, from uh, you know, skimping and starving, uh, and thereby being much more atrophied physically, that's one. But I think equally important is for the small and medium firms, how do you make sure that they live to fight uh, or to, to start up again when the economy opens up, uh, what uh, Ms. Ghosh was referring to as, as supply chains. Uh, you've got to make sure those are alive and well. And it may be, again, many of them can survive at very low levels of activity for some time. But remember, now we require, especially the ones in the hospitality sector, in, uh, um, in uh, restaurants, hotels, tourism, we require them to survive till somewhere later next year. That's a long time. Are you going to let them all die or let many of them die except the largest ones? That's really the question that we... So it's not just... Uh, it, it's not as much demand 
as in fact of supply. You're trying to keep the economy together. And that's important to note that you can't do it a year from now. There's nothing left. A lot of it has died out. So that's uh, it's, a, it's a failure of imagination in, in some sense of what the true problem is. And, uh, and I think, you know, the usual, we will lose our rating. I almost fear that a ruling has come on top. This, this government operates in a very centralized way that if you lose your rating, rating ghatna nahi chahiye. Anything else you do, but we won't lose our rating because that can be shown to the world we've managed properly. I think that's that's as uh, Ms. Gore said, that's that's uh, is self-defeating because if we don't preserve the growth, our debt level is going to be too high. I mean, we are going to go to 80, 90 percent uh, debt to GDP even without doing any additional spending. If your GDP doesn't grow as fast, this becomes a huge burden. The right. way to tackle it is to grow faster. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll come back to that point on uh, on uh, the channels and the distribution. So what you're saying is really the distribution challenges or perceived distribution challenges is is placing a roadblock or or uh, preventing uh, those who uh, decide from acting on uh, let's say a stimulus package, which is more about placing money in people's pockets. Okay. So I, I'm I'm going to come back to that. You know. Uh, let me pose a slightly different question. So we were looking at about 110 million jobs lost in uh, May, June. We are actually now almost uh, zero as far as informal sector is concerned. Uh, we have job losses in the formal sector. Uh, I don't have the latest numbers, but it was about 18, 19 million jobs uh, a month ago. Now, uh, which is a slightly different outcome from what maybe uh, we thought would be. Now, this also suggests that the economy has uh, some sort of uh, resilience or maybe more than when we thought. Now, the question to both of you is, did you expect that uh, this economy or maybe uh, even others would bounce back in the manner uh, that they have? And if so, is, is it in spite of the government or because of the government? Uh, Dr. Ghosh? Well, you know, I, I presume you're using the CMIE data when you're talking yeah. about this recovery. Yeah, yeah. And remember that that data is disproportionately skewed to the formal employees. I mean, the yeah. nature of the survey is such that it is much more skewed to formal employment and therefore it doesn't really capture the full extent of informal job loss. But the other is that, look, this is not a country that gives unemployment insurance or any kind of social protection. People have to survive in any possible way they can. And it really means that therefore whatever you can do, even if it gets you 10 rupees a day, you will do it. That's, that's not a recovery. That's not a revival. That's not a bounce back. That is just the fact that we provide almost no social protection at all to 95% of our workers. So I don't see that as an indication of any kind of V-shape uh, or so on. I think, you know, the problem no, is... My the, question is a little different. My, my question is, whatever it is, uh, is it because of the government or is it in spite of the government? Oh, very much in spite of the government, I regret to say. There's one aspect of this issue that I think we, we just have to bear in mind, which is the, the federal aspect. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of these transfers that Dr. Rajan was talking about correctly, that there are all kinds of concerns about how they are done and so on. But ultimately, they are handled by state governments. And every state government pretty much has its own mechanism. I mean, Orisha has figured out a way to hand out pensions without relying on Aadhaar and, and so on. The, you know, food distribute, all of these are really the handle of state governments. State governments are the ones being utterly deprived of funds. They are left holding the entire baby of the pandemic. They are also left to deal with the economic fallout, the social and economic violence fallout, everything. And yet they are being starved of funds. Now, I think this has implications which are certainly macroeconomic, but they also have implications for the very survival of a federal polity. I don't know how long you can push this and whether you can actually hope for a unified, strong country when you are straining these relationships to that extent. So I think the very, very cynical refusal to release the full amount of the GSD compensation at the very beginning, that was remarkable also because it was so completely illegal, reneging on a signed contract. But it was macroeconomically stupid, I believe, because you really needed, you were not taking on it. The, the central government was having announced a lockdown in a centralized fashion, was not taking on any of the responsibility for dealing with the outcomes. 
State governments were left to deal with this with less money, with collapsing revenues of uh, shares of revenues of their own, with no independent revenue raising powers, and not even provided the money that they were due. They, many of them have taken loans uh, along that peculiar scheme that was developed as a way of somehow co you know, dealing with that fact that the central government, they are now reaching the limit even of their ability to take that extra 1% of GDP. What is going to happen to the states? There are I, several finance ministers have already said that they will not be able to pay salaries in December. Right. So we are looking at a fiscal cliff of the worst possible kind, in a way. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's you're still uh, outlining the problems, and there are many. Uh, the discussion oh, I is think on solutions. how to rescue. If you're for solutions, easy, easy. Uh, okay. I mean, and, 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 solutions that have been stated from the very beginning. Okay. Expand. And, and, yeah, okay, you, you don't want those now. Right. No, 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 I, I do want them, but I, let me come back to you in a second. Uh, Dr. Rajan, so, you know, uh, and I'm going to come to banking, of course, in a second, because I, I'm assuming that's integral to some of the problems. You know, when, if we, is this an opportunity to reimagine this economy uh, and this country and the way we uh, run the economy? Uh, in that reimagination, should we be thinking of new thoughts? Uh, you know, your third pillar approach, for instance, uh, you know, and you, you know, you kind of alluded to it in the, in the opening as well. Uh, uh, or is it really, uh, you know, bringing out older thoughts and maybe implementing and executing them differently? I mean, just to take a step further back. You know, almost surely uh, we have to do things differently, right? Uh, I, I would argue that um, after the first flurry of growth uh, post liberalizations, we slowed considerably because we didn't think of new ways of reinventing ourselves. I'd say the last reformist government was probably the NDA, uh, in to th which uh, whose term ended in 2004. After that, we've reformed in uh, not so much growth enhancing reforms, but distribution enhancing reforms, which which is fine. But ultimately, you need the growth to provide the resources for the distribution. And uh, what this this change in emphasis, in fact, is partly why we are in in a, in a fiscal uh, in fiscal stress. I mean, this current government has. Uh, been fairly good at implementing distributional reforms, uh, but because we've slowed down significantly in growth, we haven't got the resources, at least to the extent that we need. And, and really, uh, I mean, India being a vast country, we have to have reforms that allow, you know, the productive capacity of each and every one to, uh, to be engaged. Uh, that means uh, certainly working on their capabilities, uh, better education, healthcare, et cetera, which we need to get uh, everybody to be able to compete in this modern economy. But we also need, uh, you know, better infrastructure. We need uh, the ability to open a firm more easily. We need less economic concentration of power, uh, but more, more spreading of opportunity. I mean, these are uh, easy to say, uh, hard to implement. But we absolutely need to think of what kinds of reforms we, we, we have to do to make this possible, to you know, essentially engage the energy of the people. And uh, for far too long, uh, I think after that initial flurry of reforms, uh, we've, we've sort of gone back to old ways, so much so that uh, now, I mean, I, I actually don't know what Atmanirbhar means, but uh, uh, I would like to believe that it is expanding the productive capacity of our people uh, so that uh, we can do more, but it doesn't hopefully mean uh, putting curbs on competition, uh, whether domestic or foreign, so that, uh, you know, that is a force which keeps uh, pressure on all of us to do better, and we need that. So, uh, bottom line, what, what I would do is, you know, uh, there are lots of uh, reforms that have been discussed over time. Perhaps this is where uh, Professor Ghosh and I would, uh, would part ways a little. We've been uh, agreed on so many things. I do think that uh, we need to think of uh, a better way to acquire land, which means uh, much clearer mapping of who owns the land but also a sensible way by which uh, a, a seller and a buyer can can uh, voluntarily agree. And, uh, you know, uh, at the last resort, for public purposes, a land acquisition process which is reasonable. Uh, we have a tremendous need for infrastructure. Uh, 
it is important to protect the weaker segments of society from being dispossessed of their land, but it is also important to make possible some uh, sort of building out of that infrastructure without requiring a government which is first world in its capacity, and we simply do not have that. Uh, so how do we uh, enhance the land acquisition process in a way that is fair, uh, but in a way that doesn't take it, that is not interminable and that and, and which is largely voluntary to the extent possible. So how do we do that? That's one of the most important things we need to think about because countries grow initially based on infrastructure. It creates low skilled jobs. It creates a lot of capacity for logistics, which enhances manufacturing jobs. It's the way each of our East Asian sort of uh, peers has grown. How do we do that in a more effective way? Uh, how do we enhance the capacity for rural industry? Again, a huge source of jobs. But again, we talk a lot about it. We've done very little. Uh, well, you know, there are successes. Let us not minimize the successes. Milk, great success. Can we process it more? Can we do more on uh, various forms of rural industry using our agricultural produce, which could be enormous. Uh, so these are things we need to think about. A new way of growth for India, it's not impossible, but uh, it needs a lot more and widespread action, not just from the center. Part of our problem is it's too centralized right now. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh, can I uh, come back to you? Uh, Okay, I mean, let me let me first, let's first pick up on uh, the the rescuing part, and uh, let me also pose the same question to you. So, if you were to take a step back, and if I were to ask you to re-architect uh, or reimagine, uh, also, you know, and and there is a specific context for this. Uh, at least many others talk about. We've had eight months of uh, uh, or nine months of uh, COVID uh, life now, and uh, this is a crisis. And uh, India has reformed in crisis, and uh, maybe those opportunities are there or were there, uh, and maybe uh, we can still do something which uh, uses this crisis effectively. Uh, maybe we can reimagine our health system, uh, though that's not what we are discussing today. But uh, how how, do, how would you pick up on these thoughts? Yes, well, thank you. I, I think, you know, Dr. Rajan has said, uh, again, many, many things that I agree with. Maybe I would say my emphasis would be a little different on certain issues, and particularly in the short term, in terms of let's think of how we can uh, sort of join a revival with an expansion. So the revival, obviously, in the first instance, has to be based on demand, which is hugely influenced by existing programs like the employment guarantee. So once again, I repeat, we make the employment guarantee available to every adult, not per household. We expand the number of days. We introduce an urban employment guarantee. Some of us have argued that some of this, when we are expanding it, we should actually use some of this as a wage subsidy for micro and small enterprises. That is to allow them to hire workers and pay the excess over the wage, the MNRG AJ wage rate so that they get some kind of a subsidy, which in turn helps them to survive over what is a very, very critical period, as Dr. Rajan has already mentioned. But the bigger other thing is that we have hugely underprovided basic services, health and education. These are very employment generating. We are among the world's worst performers, and certainly even at the same level of per capita income, we underprovide. If we provided Sweden levels, of let's say public employee per population or even Brazil levels of public employee per population, which is what delivers these services, we would be quadrupling, quintupling the workforce. So I would say, you know, when you said we're not talking about health, we have to talk about health. I don't see it only as a welfare issue or a pandemic issue. It is also a macroeconomic issue. This is also a means of employment generation with very, very strong multiplier effects. And it's a service sector which we know adds to quality of life in myriad ways and adds to resilience of society. So yes, dramatic expansions also in health and education, expending and in personnel, including reimagining our health system so that we do not rely on unpaid and underpaid workers like Anganwadi workers and ashas who are not even classified as government employees. But we have a proper functioning professional workforce like every other country in the world in all of these, right. and we don't have parallel teachers and so on and so forth. Finally, I would say, yes, it's a critical moment because we obviously need to change the direction of our economy in a more green and blue way that is more conserving of water and more enabling 
of the new kinds of technologies that will actually uh, mitigate climate change, allow us to adapt to climate change and so on. That requires huge public investment. There's no doubt about that. There are, I believe, I mean, Ms. Dr. Rajan will know much better than me, the creative ways in which the central bank can help. Uh, and some countries are already experimenting with that. There are ways in which you can set up funds, special purpose vehicles that will do the kind of, you know, long term, significant and absolutely crucial green investments that are required for that we will have to do. And, you know, right. this is also time to reimagine the food systems, which are unfortunately globalized in the wrong ways to make them more local, sustainable, to encourage the distribution chains to develop in ways that do not destroy both health and ecology to change right. the way to agriculture. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm going to pose the reform uh, in crisis question to Dr. Rajan, but I, I will pick up on what you said that one is, uh, you know, green investments and uh, it's not linked to crisis, but green investments, uh, it's an opportunity to revisit and rethink and uh, use uh, our, uh, the health challenges as a challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, use it also or, or see it as a platform for uh, uh, job expansion and, and obviously rebuilding the health sector in a way that we can also meet future pandemic challenges. So, Dr. Rajan, it's back to you. So, is, it, is, is this a reform, uh, a crisis for reform or reform for crisis opportunity? And if so, what would be the, your uh, prescriptions or priorities? Uh, I, I think Professor Ghosh is right that we need to uh, ramp up to there first by focusing on the immediate problems. And I, I would just add another immediate problem is the debt load. I mean, uh, as you go without revenue for a long time and a lot of costs, if you're lucky enough to borrow, you've borrowed. Some of these people have borrowed from the banks. Some have gone to money lenders, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, for households, it is going to be an issue, but it's also an issue for small and medium enterprises. It may even be an issue for large enterprises. In the U.S., a lot of large firms have enormously increased their debt over the course of the, of the pandemic. So how to deal with that debt going forward? Because the debt can serve to constrain growth, serve to constrain your ability to raise working capital. That's an issue we need to think about. And we need to expand our means of restructuring that debt today. Uh, right now, uh, you know, uh, a lot of banks don't have the willpower to actually restructure debt. Uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, our uh, legal structures, the debt recovery tribunals, the NCLT has actually has been put out of service for new 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 cases for a little while. We, we need to think about whether all this makes sense, given how much debt we'll have to deal with. So that's that's another issue I'd put uh, front and squarely on the government's plate. I think uh, Dr. Ghosh points to a lot of very interesting and important challenges we have, uh, how to go more green, how to you know use water more effectively, how to improve the quality of our water uh, distribution systems, delivery systems, how, how to improve uh, urban zoning, for example. I mean, look at what, what uh, uh, you know, Chennai has become and uh, how we had the flood a few years ago, simply because we've uh, concretized every part there, all the ponds, all the... Uh, so we need to, we need to be uh, cleverer on that, all that. But we cannot do all that without also having the resources, which means we need to grow. And this is, goes back to your point, is this a time for reform? Well, every time is a time for reform, I say. We, we've, we've sort of punted on what we need to do, but we need to do it in a careful way. We are a country with a lot of poor people, so reforms can't impose a lot of pain now for future gain. They have to, in a sense, ensure that uh, everybody is carried along and whatever pain is there is, is moderate or very minor initially, uh, rather than uh, the kind of very painful reforms that happen elsewhere. I do think that uh, there are ways of crafting reforms, uh, building more consensus, but we need all sides to come to the table and figure out how to do it. So, you know, we've had some moves on labor. Uh, I am not a labor expert. I wish it had been done with more consensus. We have to see how it works. A lot of reforms in India are fine and forget. I'll do it, but I want to see how it works. But it turns out it doesn't work because something we didn't take care of, something we didn't change, it creates a lot of conflict and it dies. No, we need to be constantly monitoring what happens and change accordingly so that the reform actually works as advertised. If the intent is providing more jobs, more secure jobs, how do we do it going forward? That's that's something to think about every reform. I'll, I'll end by saying, you know, there are lots of 
ideas on the table. But what we have to recognize is that we are still not large enough an economy to be self-sufficient. There are people who say, forget the outside world, we can grow on our own, let's put up all the barriers. We're not. And if we need to grow, we need to be open, not just to goods and services, but also to people. We do need uh, talented people from abroad to come. Uh, we do need to send people abroad to get talents and come back. So that flow also has to be there. But uh, most important, we should be open to ideas. And what I fear is that the growing environment of, uh, of uh, hyper-nationalism sometimes says, not invented here, so we're not going to pay attention to it. And that, I think, is problematic. Uh, as one of uh, the advisors in the finance ministry has written, uh, Sanyal, that uh, we have been most flourishing as a country when we were open to ideas from around the world. Uh, the time of the Cholas, for example, uh, the uh, sort of Indian empire, I'm not saying we should go back to an empire, but was built on trade. And we need to understand that openness is not a weakness, it is a strength. The ability to pick and choose ideas from outside, the ability to sell your goods outside. But if you want to sell your goods outside, you should also be willing to import goods. The idea of only selling but not buying makes no sense from an economist's perspective. So let's uh, you know, embrace uh, openness in many ways. Uh, I think those are some of the things we need to do. Of course, there's a whole political angle which we need to uh, uh, focus on, but that's for right. another day. Right, okay, <laughs> and I, I still have a banking question, but you know, when you talk about uh, imports, now uh, there are two, it, I think it bifurcates into two questions. One is the China question, which is obviously a, a strategic uh, military uh, and political question, as well as uh, and imports in general. Uh, a lot of what we are affected by perhaps is Chinese imports, uh, because that's what we consume and so on. So how, how would you look at that uh, dichotomy, if so? Well, I'm Sorry. Uh, no, no, please go uh, ahead. No, please go ahead. No, no, you, you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll go get to this after you, please. No, I, I, I wanted to hear what you say, so do, do carry on, yeah. No, no, I, I was just going to say, look, um, uh, there have been other times, uh, remember when, you know, uh, uh, any kind of import, it wasn't just Chinese, fortunately now it's just Chinese, but any kind of import was a threat to our industry because we were so bad at doing anything. And I do remember the early 2000s when for the first time I sensed a confidence amongst our manufacturers, we, the lowest cost steel manufacturers, Bharat Forge does wonderful things and sells across the world. We were confident. What we've done over the last 20 years, whether because we've uh, not uh, done the appropriate reforms or because uh, we've let that side of our industry dominate, we've become pessimistic again. We cannot compete with the rest of the world. If we let the rest of the world come in, we'll be wiped out. Well, we let the rest of the world come in the auto sector. Our old auto sector did get wiped out. But we will build a new auto sector with many more jobs, much more modern, right? Including, you know, for a little while, Tata built, a, uh, built some very good cars. Now, I, I think they're trying again, and yeah. hopefully they will, uh, they will succeed in expanding their market share. But it is pessimism, I think, is a fault. We, we will have difficulties meeting the competition initially. It's already in here. The idea is how do we expand our production capabilities so as to do it more cheaply and to meet the competition. So where things are unfair, for sure, try and deal with it, right? Sometimes we have uh, entered into treaties where there is some unfairness on the finished product versus intermediate goods. Let's fix all that. We've got plenty of good economists to figure out what the problems are. But as a blanket rule, just elevating tariffs to protect our industry, we tried that a long time ago, didn't work. And instead, let's embrace openness. There are people who are going to be hurt. Uh, the West has shown again and again that it has been uh, relatively poor at supporting those people. We can be different. We have to figure out how to do it better. Right on 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 banking and uh, and debt. I mean, it's, I know it's a that's another hour to uh, uh, of discussion. But a, a, one quick question there. Now uh, it does not look like we are in a mood to uh, change the ownership structure of 
the banking system. And I mean 70% of the banking system, uh, which is owned by the government. If that's not going to be the case or not likely to be the case in the near future, what else can change? Uh, everything else is either going to be bad or may have likely got worse because of moratoriums and uh, worsening debt, uh, uh, you know, uh, debt profiles of companies and so on. I, I, I'll be very quick because I want to hear Professor Ghosh on, on this stuff. Uh, on, on, I'm not a, a, a um, believer that ownership uh, change without governance change will make a huge difference. Uh, I always believed in a mixed system. Uh, my uh, concern about the Indian banking system is the governance of the public sector system has been so bad over time. Uh, the incentives for management, the, inc the compliance structures within the system, the board structures, uh, we've made some attempts to change those, but they have been at the margin and very, very minimal. And so over time, as I see the amount of funds that are being consumed by the public sector banking system, the latest sort of problem is the mudra loans, which are entirely within the phase of this uh, particular administration. Uh, you know, we find new ways to lose money through the public sector every so often. That is not to say that you cannot run the public sector well, but that requires a tremendous change in the governance style, in the governance system. And over time, more and more people have given up on trying to make that change. We tried to make that change. Um, I would argue it largely got hijacked. Uh, and, and the problem is, if you don't make that change, it is not only consuming a lot of resources that could be used more effectively, but it is also holding back credit growth. Our right. credit to GDP for a country is abysmal, 50, 60 percent of GDP. And yet we managed to generate so many NPAs. We have to ask, what's the problem? This is a system that doesn't work. And I would argue that, yeah, I mean, uh, privatizing is no panacea, especially if you privatize to a corporate house. Uh, I, we rule that out through, uh, from the RBI through, uh, through regulation. But I would argue that we need to think about running this system much better, which means significant governance change. And some of that could in, involve selling shares widely, but bringing in private sector governance. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, you know, no, I think he's absolutely right. I think Dr. Rajan made some very important and profound points in this. The most important of which is that the incentives in the banking system are all wrong for both public and private players. And until you change that, until you fix the incentives, the ownership is, I won't even say it's irrelevant. I, I mean, unfortunately, both are open to scams, the way things are run at the moment. Uh, we used to think private is more open to scams, but that is clearly not the case. Uh, but yes, fixing the in incentives requires changing not just the governance structure, but perhaps even the attitude of government in terms of the different the purposes of banking in different areas. And to that, I would just add a footnote that I think the absence of development banks is something that India has paid dearly for in the last 20 years. That leads me to just the, the China-India point. You know, China over the last four decades has spent 20 percent of GDP on infrastructure. India has spent on average two to three percent. So it's not surprising that they're much better at everything and so on. I mean, look, logistically, it's an, to me, it's, it's a source of amazement that anybody can export from India when you think of all the constraints that they have to face. So you, you don't spend this little amount on infrastructure without paying that cost. So I do believe that that's a critical element in, in, in ensuring that openness works for everyone. Having said that, I also believe you have to be open, certainly to imports, to ideas, to people, but you also need a trade and industrial policy. You have to do that thing about, you know, intermediate versus final goods, about which particular sectors, about where you have employment that is going to be hugely affected and how you protect those. So you do have to do this in a context of a I would argue trade, industrial, and technology policy. Right. We don't seem to have that anymore. Okay, cool. Okay, I, I'm going to jump to uh, questions, and there have been uh, quite a bit, and I'm already running a little late. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Rajan, uh, your book, The Third Pillar, talked about you know uh, addressing those who've lost from trade and technology. Now, COVID has actually accelerated that, and that's a question from uh, uh, Satish. Uh, he says COVID brought out the level of economic, social, and digital inequality in our society, and how do we reduce them? Yeah, I think COVID basically. Um 
uh, deepened every fault line that existed right in every country uh, we've seen the plight of the migrants in india we've uh, we've got the frontline workers here who are largely low paid while you know uh, highly paid service workers are able to do work from home uh, 45% of the economy in the us 10% in bangladesh and of course we get paid far better than the uh, the people on the front line so uh, that inequality has certainly increased and uh, you know for by many counts that's also the reason demand is so weak across the world we need to fix that i would fix it by leveling up to the extent possible building capabilities which goes back to the point about we need uh, as professor gore said focusing on 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 um health on education these are uh, are uh, fixes in industrial countries these are also likely to be fixes in the emerging markets in addition we need that infrastructure she talked about to make us able to compete uh, across the world so there is there is a path uh, by which we can reduce all these uh, all these um, inequalities uh, and it is a path which hopefully will lead to a happier future but we need to start we need to have started 20 years ago uh, but certainly today is already uh, way past the time to start we should do it now okay uh, sunil chavan asked uh, let me post uh, put this to you dr gosh when revenue is so low from where should one get the money uh, to spend except to print more money well in the short term yes you print more money short term i, I mean i think that that's a no brainer right and everybody else in the world is doing it i don't see why we should not but yes obviously over time you have to raise revenues here i'm all for reform and i would argue for tax reform in two major areas introducing a reform whereby multinational companies pay the same rate of tax as domestic companies by going for a system of unitary taxation where we say well apple your global profits are this much our share of our, your user sales revenues etc is this much we are going to tax you 25% of that global profit which can be done it could even be done unilaterally if there's no global agreement and the other is a wealth tax on the extremely wealthy i mean we have seen the extremely wealthy in india double their wealth during the pandemic if you take 4% of their wealth they're not even going to notice it <laughs> okay and it was estimated there was an estimate done by my friend uh, subramaniam and mids who said if you tax the top richest 965 families 4% of the wealth you get 1% of gdp which will double our total health spending so when you say health you mean the uh, the we sorry wealth you mean wealth is defined by market capitalization and so on or wealth as an income no, i mean look we can't capture all wealth obviously but there are some bits of wealth you can capture real estate okay. financial okay. assets dr dr rajan do you agree with that well my worry is that uh, 4% of gdp is uh, of their wealth seems relatively small but it's a huge amount of money lots of well paid lawyers will be spending a lot of time figuring out how to hide all that wealth in different trusts different uh, uh, you know uh, structures so uh, I am uh, a little less uh, uh, sort of con convinced that it will be easy to uh, to tax. Uh, forget the uh, whether it's the right thing to do or not. It's just that uh, uh, when you tax uh, very heavily, uh, people find all sorts of ways around it. I mean, look at Europe. Uh, you have uh, immensely wealthy people, but it's all buried in small uh, trusts and companies and so on. So I think the the idea might be, uh, you know, uh, we certainly need to increase compliance for sure. Uh, there are so many people who owe taxes, and you know, you and I know many uh, who who sometimes used to make it a, a, a you know, a be be proud that they weren't paying the taxes they owed. We need to make tax compliance uh, much more effective, but also dishonorable. to not pay your taxes and this is where I, i i would argue that if we have a sensible information sharing structure with constraints on what the government can do with that information some some kind of uh, protection of individual pri privacy but get at the large uh, unaccounted wealth through that uh, you will create a better in environment for tax compliance and and certainly our tax compliance is way below where it should be okay and and uh, your your argument against demonetization was similar that people will find a way around it well i i didn't uh, uh, understand uh, what the what the whole point was if in fact uh, the clever ones would find their way around it and you would end up harassing the ordinary citizen 
who may have sort of put away some money for legitimate reasons now had to explain to the officer why they had 40,000 in a jar. I mean, most people hold a lack of middle class people hold a lack somewhere in in their godridge because they need to spend on emergencies. We don't have credit card use, right? So so now to have to pull that out, uh, uh, I understand a lot of, uh, you know, women were saving for the household, keeping it separate from the household expenses, and now to have to reveal that. I mean, it caused a lot of disruption for what re, for what value I, I am less, uh, less convinced okay. that it was necessary. Okay, Dr. Ghosh, back to you. Shneela Parveen asked, how effective would be uh, universal basic income as a measure in these times? You know, um, I personally am more in favor of employment programs than a universal basic income. But my other fear in countries like India is that it would be used to replace basic services rather than to add to them. And I think that was also the stated intent in some of the, the official documents that came out. So I have two concerns. One, that the amounts distributed would be so small that they would become irrelevant and rapidly eroded by inflation. And second, that this would be a ploy to actually cut down on essential public spending for basic services. So these are my concerns with that in a country like India. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Sir, just adding to that, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I think that uh, a, a sort of low-hanging fruit in India is how to make sure that people get the basic services that they have been promised, right? Can we use technology far better to make sure that people who are, uh, you know, promised medical services, are promised various forms of insurance, are promised educational services, actually get them and of a reasonable quality? And that's something we need to really work on because, because that's, that's a place where we're underserving the people. Can I just come back? One Please. quick intervention on that. You know, that's absolutely true, but we have to look at the variation within India. Tamil Nadu and Kerala actually provide really good health services at every level, down to the you know, local primary health center. So right. there are good examples. There are best practices even within our own country if we care to look at it. Using absolutely. technology, I completely agree, Food Corporation of India became so effective in Jharkhand when they started implementing the electronic weighing of the truck at every stop. And it automatically reduced a significant amount of pilferage. You didn't need the Aadhaar that denied people and excluded people. You just had to sort out the logistics in a way that technology allows. Yeah. Okay, so we're uh, running to the end of our uh, conversation. So l let's go back. I mean, we said, uh, you know, uh, this is an emergency room and how do we rescue India's economy, uh, which is either a tall or very short order, depending on where you are. Uh, and uh, let me ask each of you to respond to that and also sum up from your vantage point. Uh, and let me start with you, Dr. Ghosh. So uh, the question really is, uh, you know, how do we go into this? I mean, I think it's all clear now that there are uh, multitudes of options, uh, policy prescriptions and all that, as they've always been. Uh, one of the themes that seem to com comes out, uh, seems to have come out is that we need to have an open mind. Right? If you have an open mind, then many other things follow. Uh, we uh, need to maybe trust uh, some people and maybe we need to not trust other people. Uh, we need to not centralize. Uh, we need to bring more people onto the table, exchange ideas. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, and as, 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 a, as an approach uh, as, uh, to rescuing the economy? Okay, short term, give money to state governments, expand employment guarantee, urban and rural, uh, distribute the food grain stocks, which are lying and going waste and ensure that everybody, that nobody in the country actually goes hungry. That's the short term. In the medium to long term, really think about creative ways to do green and blue investments, including using both monetary and fiscal policy. Okay, that, that's a great point. Uh, Dr. Rajan, it's uh, over to you. Uh, you know, uh, this is a Tata Lit Life discussion, and I don't know if you want to uh, delve back into your last book, and uh, you've talked about, about among other things, uh, you know, your, uh, the whole focus on uh, how markets and state have uh, usurped communities, and, and all of this has been accelerated and deepened by uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the other point that you made, I, I remember, was about inclusive localism. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it struck me that, you know, at the time of pandemic, it's really a local response that matters more than a federal response. 
so I don't mm. know how you want to pick on all of this or if you want to pick on any of this, but as you look ahead, what are the big themes that you want to leave behind to uh, for India and India's economy? I, I think the uh, point of my book, The Third Pillar, was to say that the social side fills in many holes left by the economic side, the markets, or the state, the government side. And, and clearly, we have a lot of holes right now which need filling. And you can see it in, in, for example, the voluntary organizations helping the migrants as they uh, went, you know, went home, uh, as well as the huge ramp up in uh, voluntary services uh, in order to help those uh, who are worse off in the country. So that's, that's, that's good. Uh, I mean, to some extent, uh, I have been emphasizing the need to decentralize far more. We are too large a country to be driven by center. This resonates uh, with Professor Ghosh's uh, thought that uh, it's the state and local uh, state governments which are doing a lot more uh, and have more direct contact with the people. And we need to decentralize more resources, which is something every finance commission has proposed uh, till the current one. Uh, but also, we the state governments have to decentralize far more to the local governments, to the panchayats, uh, who know what the real problem on the ground is. More, more local power means people have a greater sense that it's their responsibility, are willing to monitor what is done with the funds, are willing to act up if it's not spent properly. And that's really an energizing of our democratic forces. So I would say... Uh, more decentralization is really in our interest. Now, you know, what people don't realize sometimes is this was a huge debate at the time of the Constitution. Uh, there was the Gandhian side, which was India belongs in our villages. And there was the uh, uh, both the Ambedkar side as well as the Nehruvian side. The Nehruvian side was centralization because the central government uh, was important also in creating unity, integrity in the country. But Ambedkar, because he believed uh, central universal values, would trump the localistic, uh, more tribal values, which were holding back, uh, you know, uh, the scheduled castes. Uh, and, and my sense is we have now reached the point where, you know, we've addressed in small measure, not in full measure, some of these issues. Uh, we are a country. We are not in danger of breaking up uh, anytime soon. And decentralization is going the Gandhian way a little more is probably uh, something we can afford. And uh, I would uh, therefore argue that uh, perhaps part of our sort of rethinking of who we are and how we go forward has to be how we govern ourselves. And more local will imply much stronger democratic forces than we have today and would in a sense serve as uh, a antidote to our incipient move towards authoritarianism every few uh, every few decades and and we need a structure which works much better uh, given that so that's that's why I, I think decentralization is really important for india it's what every finance commission has proposed i hope this commission also proposes the same thing rather than a reversal of uh, of what we've done in the past can i can i, I quickly supplement that with another question i mean you are uh, in the united states uh, in chicago now uh, the elections have uh, happened and, uh, you know, one of the points uh, uh, that you have mentioned just now, I mean, a little while before we started was the institutional deterioration and what America does or will do now in order to repair uh, the institutions and including maybe the, some economic institutions is something that the world will watch and if handled well, will benefit from, uh, including, uh, let's say, uh, getting back into Paris. Uh, and uh, uh, to the to pick up on the point that uh, Dr. Ghosh made. So, what's your sense? Uh, is, is it uh, it is going to be a constrained government? But uh, will they uh, repair? And uh, if that repair happens, how will the world at large, or particularly countries like India, or can they benefit in any way? And what should we look out for? I, I think the U.S. is realizing, despite all the talk about checks and balances how few checks and balances there are to a determined authoritarian in the White House. And so hopefully over the next four years, they will figure out uh, what new checks and balances they have to put in place. And uh, there will be hopefully bipartisan support to putting in those checks. I mean, again, lots of hopes uh, uh, sort of uh, embedded in here. But what is interesting is uh, when this authoritarian wants to stay, stay in, in power, I think most people understand the courts will not support him, even though uh, he has sort of uh, appointed three people on the Supreme Court. 
the senses the institutions will hold this time. Whether the institutions would have held for another four years, I am very skeptical. And therefore, I think this is really important for the U.S.'s institutions. And, uh, you know, it's something that we, uh, every country should learn from. How do we protect the quality of our institutions as checks and balances on unbridled power? Okay, I have a minute more, uh, I'm told. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, do you want to weigh in on that last part? No, I, I think Dr. Rajan is absolutely right. I mean, look, I, I, it, it's kind of obvious, right, that the U.S. has just dodged a bullet. But I think the whole world has dodged a bullet, actually, because there are so many things at stake for the rest of the world. Paris, you mentioned, maybe an SDR issuance by the IMF. I mean, a whole range of things that uh, were being blocked are now feasible. And perhaps less support for authoritarians across the world. I think that is something we can all hope for. Okay, uh, let's, let's end uh, this, the discussion on hope. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for being candid and sharing your thoughts. Uh, uh, I, I, I do not have time, uh, nor will I attempt to uh, uh, do any further synopsization. Uh, let me hand it back to uh, Ratnavali uh, amongst the organizers. Thank you very much uh, once again for those of you who have joined in and for your questions. Thank you to the panelists and the chair for that discussion. A big thanks to the session sponsors, Prime Securities. Coming up soon, the answer to the question, can we train ourselves to analyze better, recognize and overcome ingrained instincts and thereby make better choices? To find out more, watch the session titled Poker Face at 9 p.m. tonight. Maria Konikova in conversation with Girish Shahani. And for all the drama enthusiasts, there is a fantastic session that I would not miss tomorrow at 7.45 p.m. Um, titled The Play is the Thing, where English playwright, screenwriter and theatre and film director David Hare will be in conversation with Anahita Oberoi. All this and much more happening right here at Tata Festival. See you soon. With that, I'll be signing off.